I'm very glad to wel welcome you here. Thank you for coming. I think in this circle, let me just remind you, please not to forget to switch your mobile phones back on when you leave the room. Um, in this circle, Diana Pinto needs no introduction. Um, she has um, finished her studies at Harvard. Her origins are Mongrel. Jewish, mongrel, Jewish, yeah. Italian, um, now French. But always Jewish. But always Jewish, <laughs> with long periods in America. And she is a prolific writer on questions of not only philosophy, but also identity, and yes, particularly Jewish identity. Um, but you didn't come to listen to long introductions, you came to, came to listen to what Diana Pinto has to say about tonight's topic, which is to do with the question of the possible contradictions, but certainly the interactions between particular identities, Jewish identity, and the universalist claims of Enlightenment philosophy um, on which so much of this history is grounded. Diana, the floor is all yours. All mine. Thank you, Philip. Um, I'm very happy to be participating in this series on the Enlightenment. Uh, I guess the first two things I should say is that I am not a philosopher, and I'm not a specialist of the 18th century. And I'm in the hazy world of uh, history of ideas or intellectual history, which means that basically you take whatever is being said in a given time and you follow it through decades or centuries and you see the ironies that surround it mainly as it goes up and down, not unlike Wall Street's shares. And so that is what we middling intellectual historians do as opposed to philosophers who actually think. The task is rather impossible, because first of all, how can you talk about the Enlightenment on one end and the Jewish response to it when there are many types of Enlightenments and, and even more types of Jews? And uh, so you could almost say that it could be a pointeist artwork in which you have so many dots of you know, religious enlighteners, of political ones, philosophical ones, economic ones, and then on the other side, all sorts of types of Jews and what kind of bridges were made between them. And yet, even as in a Pointe's painting, a figures emerge and tensions emerge. And you can see this. And uh, I must say that let's, if you take the topic of the Enlightenment and, the rea and Jewish particularism, I must say that as an intellectual historian, I'm struck by the way this was the key issue in the 18th century because the Jews were the iconic other of Western civilization since forever, even before Christianity. So in the 18th century, of course, it rang a bell. The Enlightenment and the Jewish question or the Jewish issue. What amazes me today from the standpoint of 2014 is to what an extent this issue has become burning today not just for the Jews, but for others, but for the Jews themselves. So it's not just the Jews is in what happened to them in the past, but the Jews today as they act, whether here or even in Israel, because of course one cannot speak of the Jews today without having a feeling of creating the whole dialectic between the Israelis and the Jews themselves. And this is, for instance, in the 1960s, I think no one would have understood having a conference on the Enlightenment and Jewish particularism, except as a historical conference in which a few academics would have showed up to discuss, you know, how was Mendelssohn treated in a Berlin salon. Nowadays, instead, it really rings a bell. And it was rather strange, because preparing for this conference, I went back to my little classics and discovered that my very own Kant, which I purchased, I had literally purchased 43 years ago down to the day, because the date on it had November 6th, 1971. Yes, I'm very old, as you can see. Uh, but the point is that um, the British being what they are, pragmatic, interested in economic things, it is quite interesting that John Tolan made his argument for bringing back the Jews to the UK in 1714. So three centuries for that particular type of an enlightened un understanding of what the Jews should be and how they should be treated. So uh, 
What is at stake? If you'll bear with me, I will read to you two quotes with which we can then kind of measure the field and uh, move forward. The first one is from a Frenchman, written a few months ago. Now busily building monuments and museums, Europe ostentatiously engages in celebrating and mourning its lost dead Jews of yesterday, whose murder it variously perpetrated, abetted, or with exceptions found it could put up with. Meanwhile, it encourages and underwrites the withering of Jewish life today. Once again, Jews are accepted on condition that they separate themselves from their brethren in Israel and join the official European consensus in demonizing the Jewish state. That they learn to accommodate the reality that so many ethnic Europeans hate them and wish them ill, and that Islamists on European soil seek their extinction and that in the interest of justifying their continued claim to European citizenship, they accept Europe's proscription of some of the most basic practices of their faith. And the article ends, to the dead Jews of yesterday, everything. To the living Jews of today, little or littler. Now you can perhaps immediately recognize that with this last statement, the author is making an explicit reference to Stanislas de Clermont-Tonnerre in his speech at the French National Assembly at the end of December 1789, when the whole question of emancipating the Jews of France was made. In his particular statement was quite literally this, in English translation, of course. The Jews should be denied everything as a nation, but granted everything as individuals. They must be citizens. There cannot be one nation within another nation. If, and then the continuation, which is seldom evoked. If they do not want this, in other words, to become full citizens, they must inform us, and we shall then be compelled to expel them. So here is Michel Gurfinkel, a right-wing Jew who has become an art representative of the antipathy toward what's happening in France explaining in an article called You Only Live Twice, mm -hmm. which is a nice take on John Le Carré, but a tragic take at that because in reality what he's saying is that the Jews of Europe were exterminated once, nearly, and they came back, and now they're really going to be killed the second time around, so you only live twice. This is the extent of some of the statements that one can hear in France today and that are gobbled up by Israel and America in saying, aha, the French Jews are leaving en masse. It's the end of French Jewry. It will be the end of European Jewry. And uh, this is all a self-fulfilling prophecy in the mind, but it's a very important one. So since we're talking about the Enlightenment and Jewish particularism, and the Enlightenment was about reason, I leave you with this first quote because where has reason gone? The second quote is much more complex and lead us to some of the key issues in the decades to come. I shall tell you who he is in a second. Though I am a product of enlightenment and emancipation, the I speaking is not me, I don't think it is enough today to respond to the traditionalist revival the Jewish traditionalist revival, by reiterating 19th century descriptions of Jewish universalism. Judaism is manifestly not a religion of ethical reason. No one looking at contemporary orthodoxy and ultra-orthodoxy can have any illusions about that. I am looking for something else, and this is his vision of what a universalism could be in the future. For the concrete, inescapable universalism of people who are not, so to speak, first order universalists. These arguments are valuable and worth recovering precisely because the universalist positions they sometimes defend differ from the standard versions of philosophical universalism. They reflect the impact of a strongly particularist creed and they represent most of the time a voice from below. Enlightenment universalism in its original French version was, after all, the universalism of an elite class in the leading country of the Western world. And though the Jewish maskilim, the enlighteners of the Jewish 
people were from a different class and country, they did the best they could to adapt and naturalize the original version. Pre-emancipation Jewish universalism, by contrast, is the universalism of the weak. I want to reclaim it now without pretending that it dominates the tradition. These are Michael Walzer's words in an article that he wrote in May 2001, therefore before 9-11, but in the midst of the Second Intifada, when he gave the annual Markenthal Memorial Lecture Series on universalism and Jewish values. And what was he trying to do there? He was basically trying to short circuit the Western, noble, he's a man so he couldn't say it, white, male position that if one were not white or male could have been popular to define like that by saying, eh, you can't go back to that. The Enlightenment, well, it was basically French nobles. And therefore, we've got to find something else from the root up people, the poor man's enlightenment, the poor man's individual uh, universalism, and only on that can we build. And I have problems with this, and I will try to explain why in the coming minutes, although I do want to leave time for questions, of course, and I mean it seriously, not just rhetorically. Because is the enlightenment just French noblemen, English merchants, and the son of a saddle maker in Königsberg? And nothing else to be said about that? Was it just a time, a moment, a kind of little trademark for Europe and its ancillary countries, let's say America, and whatever, the confettis of the British Empire, all the way down to New Zealand? Uh, or was there more to this? Can we just drop it? Or even though they were French and noble, white and male, did they still have something that they touched which is relevant to all of us, irrespective of our identities, origins, colors, sex, or whatever. This is a burning issue. And one of the other burning issues that I have to link to this is that, first of all, it's not neutral that in these two sentences, in these two texts, one is going straight back to the Enlightenment. You could have expected Michel Rufinkel to say something about the horrors of the church. No, no, no. Because nowadays, Judeo-Christian dialogue and sometimes Judeo-Christian-Muslim dialogue are wonderful. So the culprit is not the religious people. The culprit is those who wanted to come with reason and carry forth with the notion of reason independently of a locus or a place or an identity. And the Michael Walzer, who says that he's a product of the Enlightenment, the Emancipation, is looking desperately for an alternative. And the rest of his lecture, which was really on foreign policy, is based on Hosea, Amos, the Bible, about how to relate with other peoples, as though you could defend Jewish universalism on those lines. And of course, Walzer, with Michael Lorberbaum, was, is the author of Jewish Political Thought, which is an attempt to explain or to, to imagine a, a parallel or alternative vision of the polis, in itself hardly a Jewish term, based on Jewish texts. So this is, to me, one of the big issues. Uh, and I bring it back to the issue now of the Jewish people, because irrationally is for Gorfinkel or rationally for Walzer. One can actually ask oneself today whether that particular encounter between the Jews and the Enlightenment may be over, and that maybe the Jewish world, again, I'm using broad categories, not certainly many of the Jews within it, are instead moving elsewhere with other references. And Walzer himself was quite explicit about saying that after all, if Amartya Sen can talk about Asian values, he can talk about Jewish values, and we can have a new universalism based on these particular different values. And a friend of mine once told me, you know, there's no point hanging around saying I want to be a fruit. You can only be a fruit if you're a banana, a grape, an apple, a pear, or an orange. You can't be a fruit. Therefore, you cannot be universal unless you are something else before. And the something else before brings me very rapidly to the whole issue of 
Did something go wrong? Of course something went wrong because after the Enlightenment we had Auschwitz. But does that definitively make the break with respect to the Jewish issue? Or what was happening between the Jews and the Enlightenment? And so, first of all, I want to do it just telegraphically. Don't, I'm not going to, it would take more than a semester to go through the whole thing, maybe a year's worth. But let me give you three dates. They all end with 77, so I thought that was cute. For an historian, I enjoy these things. 1777. Mendelssohn has a business trip and stops on the way to Königsberg and actually goes to meet Kant. We have the account from a student who saw this hunchback, ugly-looking Jew walking into the university and saying, well, what is he doing there? And Kant discovers he's there, goes to greet him, and they walk out together. And this is a moment of an incredible symbiosis between reason, natural law, values, humanism, the Jew, the Lutheran, I suppose, um, and coming together. And I think there were prints of it made not unlike that of Frederick II and Voltaire coming together naturally sans souci. So at that point, you have a moment of convergence, reason, faith in reason, natural law, universal belonging. It's an apotheosis. And Mendelssohn comes to incarnate for 19th century Jewry, those who wish to assimilate, the apex and the apogee of a certain way of reasoning, of being open, accepting, for instance, that people be, bur Jews be buried three days after rather than immediately because the Prussian law says that you never quite know if it, you know, someone's in a coma or not, and explaining this. The second 77 is 1877, and that's the year formerly in which Samuel Samson Raphael Hirsch decides to leave the Berlin Jewish Gemeinde with his group of Orthodox Jews to create his own movement and group. He can only do that, mind you, because the Prussian king has just given the right in 1876 to all citizens to not have to obligatorily be registered in a Jewish community, in a religious community. Consequently, even as he says no to a certain type of Jewish assimilation, he can only do so because the authority of the Prussian state is giving him that position. But with that succession, you have the end of what we could call the compromise made by the Jews vis-a-vis -vis the enlightened state that was welcoming them, which meant, one, the end of juridical autonomy of the community. In other words, the community would no longer have its own legal binding Two, the adoption of dress that would be Western and no longer kaftan-like. Three, the use of the language of the country rather than using officially for documents or whatever, Yiddish or something else, if there need be. And, I, and for the acceptance of becoming citizens. Hirsch was for, for all of this. What he resented was the absolute assimilation and you know, diluting of the Jewish identity that then continued to the point where he would say that the Jews of Germany no longer read Hebrew, did not understand, were really listening to music in the synagogue as there were church service and so forth. This is an important moment because here comes orthodoxy out of this great magma of the Enlightenment to take on its own position. After that, there will be, in those same years, in the 1860s, even more Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox Jews who come out, and they, unlike Hirsch, do not accept modernity at all, and they are the ultra-ultra-Orthodox. And it's in, the late eight, it's in the 1860s that some of them choose to move to Israel, to Palestine, and set up in Hatzit Street, in the center of the old city, the first Hasidic, I mean, uh, worshiping places that then they say even no to the accoutrements of the externals of entering the society. So 1877 marks a break from what seemed to be the inevitable progress of moving into reason, assimilation, acculturation. The third 77, and this is very eclectic, eh? I'm not sure it would pass any kind of undergraduate exam if I were taking it, but it's worth whatever it's worth. The third 77 is in Israel, and it's 1977, and it is the victory of Begin and the Likud that brings to power for the first time in Israel 
what shall we say, an anti-enlightenment, anti-labor, anti-socialist, anti-whatever used to, used to be, which was basically, you know, the cousin down the road of what was the enlightenment plus socialism movement that was, uh, that had created the state. By 1977, in the person of Begin, you have someone who is uh, hardly luminous, a man of shadows, a man of anxiety, a man of religion, a man who had been, after all, Jabotinsky's secretary, and the man who therefore could understand the vision of Israel politically as one rooted in a long, long biblical tradition, but not as folklore as national literature, but as what could be the coming that we now hear so much and so often of Blut und Boden, in other words, the land and the blood and what could be a right-wing understanding of a identity inside Israel. So these three 77s, in a sense, the two 77s that follow the great moment in which Mendelssohn and Kant uh, meet, are, show some of the unraveling. But you can also say that this unraveling was there from the beginning. After all, the anecdote approached by the notion that said that there was a rabbi in Vilna who, upon hearing that a Napoleon was practically at the doors of the city, said, it may be good for the Jews, but it will be a catastrophe for Judaism. And you have this ongoing tension, which has, in a sense, picked itself up ever more in the last years. As a historian, I'm fascinated by one thing, that you would think that the Holocaust would have been the great divide in this notion of the Enlightenment, the light, and the a link between the Enlightenment and the Jews. After all, we are all aware of the whole, the book of the dialectics of the Enlightenment of Adorno and Horkheimer. I reread the chapter on anti-Semitism and was very struck by the fact that it was so boringly mechanical and economic grounded, you thought it was still part of the debate of Bauer and Marx in the 19th century. There seemed to have been no shift in understanding so that this whole complex and convoluted dialectics of the Enlightenment could almost be forgotten and put on the shelf of some library. It did not operate in the way people assumed it might. So what happens, and I'm going to go into the post-war period immediately, there's no point for me to stall in the earlier part. Well, if you listen to those who feel that Israel has a really meh chip on its shoulder would be a slight metaphor, with respect to Europe and the Western world. The feeling would be that, you know, after World War II, the world rebuilt itself, never gave due credit to the Holocaust, barely mentioned it, and went on toward positive future knowledge with the Jews having to make do and rebuild their lives as they could. And then in many of the historiographies of Israel, you'll say 67 was the turning point. In 67, Europe began detaching itself from Israel, abandoning it in the case of the French, and then the left, which was linked to the Jewish people because the Jews were linked to the resistance, gave up on them in third world causes and so forth. I would like to provide a completely different reading of that period and say that basically the post-war European context was a return to what we could play apply or call applied count, that the European desire to reconstruct itself was based on the notion almost of perpetual peace, of removing borders, of creating a situation that would make it impossible for, the, for all the horrors of the previous half century to exist, and that then um, this particular moment, <coughs> it wasn't that the Jews shut up and were not taken into account. It was also that the Jews wanted to return to be like everyone else into a kind of universalism after they had been nearly extirpated and destroyed as singled out. So that there was something there that you could call a return to a kind of enlightenment progressive stance in which the Jews were fully participant across Europe, even in the other half of Europe, which was communist Europe. And the break may have happened in 67, but I would like to say that there was one element here of the post-war period, 
that stands to me equal to 1777, and it's 1963. If there is the meeting between um, Kant and Mendelssohn, the modern, modest equivalent for me would be Abraham Joshua Heschel and Martin Luther King in 1963 over the civil rights movement. Here we have an apogee of these universal values of freedom, liberty, that reincarnated, in a sense, the, post, the, the 18th century highest values, and that then collapsed after 67 and 68 into a world, and we may again believe here perhaps that it would be like the uh, Michael Walzer line, a world in which you go from that universal feeling of brotherhood to coalition building. In other words, we can build coalitions, but coalition building is not a universal position. It is being allied over a given cause or a given issue, and you can also lose the alliance. But there isn't that end point, like in Renaissance painting, of the final point in which you arrive. So this brings me, sadly, to uh, and this jumping through the period is X, brings me quite sadly to an understanding of what happened and what went wrong. And the what went wrong and what happened did not begin before 2000. After 67, we had a second Kantian moment, which will turn 25 years on November 9th. It was that period of Kantian interlude between 1989 and 2000, in which this whole notion of belonging and being part of a wider world and working together and being Jewish and something else, or being Israeli and involved in peace and the peace prospect of Oslo, of being able to conjugate things in a universal manner from the word go with a common identity and a common ideal lasted for those years. And those years that in my mind were really hard to qualify except that they failed, now come to me as a kind of third Kantian moment with the Jews in their midst. And after 2000 instead, we have a much worse and much more complicated situation of an extra pulling out on the basis of Israel, on the basis of Israel's needs, on the basis of an identity, and moving beyond with the feeling that those root causes were really not really present, in that they do not exist anymore, that it was all hogwash, as Mr. Gurfinkel says, that it was not true, that it did not work, and that the Jews are again the trope of this particular horrendous story that repeats itself, just as Israel is the Jew among nations in the perception of a great part of the Jewish world. Now, I know sitting here that this is certainly not the position of those here who believe this, but we have to understand that we are a minority right now. And why is the minority turned into such a problem of weakness today? What are the root reasons? And what's interesting is that the devil is seen to be in the 18th century and not in the moment of the Holocaust. And what is even more frightening is that if Europe gives up on that enlightenment, what else has it got? And more challenging in terms of the future is that if you go through the Bible and if you find new identities and give yourself other offshoots, you can have a particularistic Jewish take on the world, and then there'll be a particularistic Chinese one and an Indian one and somebody else. And when all of these identities come together and produce the kind of shell shock of a purpose that was the Enlightenment, I am not sure. And this is why I'm quite deeply troubled by the Walzer quote that I gave you, because it may mean that that particular symbiosis that was the Enlightenment and the Jews is over, and that Israel, and perhaps even the whole Jewish trope, is moving somewhere else into an ethnic nationalist identity which can fit in beautifully into the world today in its Asian conception. And I want to end here, and I excuse myself for this 
wild dancing over two centuries or even three. But I hoped to have provoked you. <laughs> <clears throat>